How to improve Detroit schools. The long-awaited recommendations are released and they are the talk of the state. Stay put. My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us for My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Ask someone how they would improve schools in Detroit or in Michigan for that matter and you'll get a lot of different ideas. What is the best way to raise test scores? Train teachers, get kids to school safely. Bottom line, what can we do so all kids can attain quality schools? After months of work, the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children released their recommendations this week for all Detroit schools. Tonight on My Week, John Ricolta Jr., one of the leaders from the coalition and also the CEO of Walbridge joins us to go through the report. How did the group arrive at these key conclusions? Are they in line with what the governor wants to do? And what will happen next? The Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children made its long-awaited recommendations on Monday afternoon. A 30-page report, the end of three months of work, meetings, and forums. The 36-member group of business, community, philanthropy, and school leaders looked at all Detroit schools, public, charter, and EAA, and came up with these key proposals. Detroit public schools should be returned to the control of an elected school board. Form the Detroit Education Commission, members to be appointed by the mayor, and oversee opening and closings of schools. Make the state assume some of DPS's debt. End the Education Achievement Authority and turn those 15 schools back to DPS. Create a system to recruit and train high-quality teachers and make charter authorizers and their boards improve transparency. To improve transportation, for all children. Some schools have transportation systems, others don't. So make, making sure that all children are able to get to school, to get to school on time, uh, and that are able to have access to that sort of a transportation system by communities. This is not just a Detroit problem. It is a Michigan problem. It is an American problem. But we live in Detroit, so obviously we're concerned but our state is not performing the way it should be. Public schools are not performing the way they should be. Unless we address the issues of poverty, of joblessness, and some of the other socioeconomic ills that plague our city and other communities, then the fix on education, while it might be much better than what we have, is still going to be void. It's still going to lack. Now, the governor said he respects the coalition's work and plans to review the recommendations. So joining us now to go through all of this is John Ricolta, Jr. He's one of the coalition's co-chairs and the CEO of Walbridge. John, it's good to see you and welcome to My Week. We appreciate you being here. Good morning. Glad to be here. And also our My Week contributors, as always, Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press and Nolan Finley of the Detroit News. All right, gentlemen, let's just jump right on in on this report. John, three months the coalition had a chance to work on this. Do you feel that you had enough time to achieve this end result? Uh, we had time, probably not enough, uh, to try to correct 40 years of um, problems and mistakes in 100 days is a very, very hard task. We, uh, we worked hard and we're very proud of the results that we uh, came forth with. You came forth with a 30-page report here. What were some of, I think, some of the tougher recommendations that you had to get agreement on? Um, well, I think all seven of them had uh, various degrees of, um, of controversy. Obviously, uh, returning to elected school board was one of them. Uh, you know, the past hasn't necessarily produced the best results and there was a lot of questions as to whether the system was in shape today to actually return to the school board, elected school board, at this point in time. Uh, we do believe in the democratic process and the fact that Detroit currently is the only city 
in the state that does not have democratic representation in its public schools. So eventually, we believe that that needs to take place, but we think that the fix needs to take place first. Do you think that that is the most controversial part of the, the plan or the recommendations that came out? I do not. I think probably the most uh, difficult thing is going to be the debt. Uh, there's an enormous debt that's been placed on the Detroit public school system. It's uh, choking off uh, the resources uh, before it gets to the kids. And uh, Detroit today is the least city or the, the city with the least amount of dollars going into the classroom and, and it shows in the results. Did you feel like, uh, speaking of that financial problem, you guys suggest that the state ought to pay a significant portion of that debt uh, on its own. Uh, but even if that happened, you're a finance guy, you see what's going on in the district. Uh, is this a district that, that, that can survive financially? Uh, if, even if you get that debt off of their backs, if you talk about the, the loss in population, the other inefficiencies uh, in the way they do things, is that, is that a solution? Uh, that's just the first step. Uh, there needs to be a complete uh, overhaul of the Detroit public school system. Uh, there are legacy costs that uh, have no responsibility at the state level. Uh, Transportation is too expensive. Uh, there's too many buildings. The system's geared for 85,000 students. Today there's 45,000. Uh, central administration is far too expensive and the list goes on and on. And so uh, what we're saying is, is that the DPS has a place. Uh, we believe that it needs to be fair and open competition, but that there needs to be a, a complete restructuring of how the entire school district works. As a finance uh, person, did you suggest the idea of bankruptcy in these deliberations at all, or did, did you think that that was something you guys ought to, ought to think about? I think that the, uh, the first conclusion would have been bankruptcy if it's possible, but uh, uh, it, it's not possible because of some of the more technical aspects of the bond issues. They all would become due and payable, including the millage bonds, and uh, that number is just far too large to swallow at this point in time. So. Uh, a traditional so bankruptcy not a is not a solution today. John, I heard um, Tanya Allen uh, this week say that a primary mission of this of this group was to create a levy, level playing field for all schools in the city. But taking a look at the performance and of the Detroit public schools and its defiance of reform over all of these years, was there any consideration at all to saying this DPS can't be fixed? Let's start with something that looks totally different, perhaps a New Orleans model where they uh, chartered all of the schools. Was that ever on the table? There's 45,000 kids in DPS today, and just to start over, uh, we believe is impractical. Uh, we don't see a pathway of closing an entire system down. What do you do with those 45,000 kids this September? So the fix has to be measured, it has to be consistent, has to be ongoing, but it's going to take some time. There's just no practical way to shut a system down that large and start over. What's creating a level field look like? Uh, that all the schools compete fairly uh, on all aspects. Uh, both of them have their own sets of problems. DPS is, uh, is burdened by legacy cost. Uh, charter schools have their own burdens. Uh, they uh, have to pay for their own buildings and their own schools, which is a burden on their on their finances. Uh, uh, charter schools have to provide transportation uh, to all uh, of its students and parents. There, there is no central transportation system. And so we need to fix all of these and let both systems compete against each other. And from my perspective, that's the best solution, to have open and fair competition from two completely different systems and let the best system win. Let's talk a little bit about the Educational Achievement Authority. One of the recommendations was that those 15 schools that are part of the EAA, which are Detroit schools should go back to DPS. What was the thought or the rationale behind that? Well, that was one of the controversial discussions. Uh, and uh, we settled on the idea that uh, EAA does uh, belong back at DPS eventually. I mean, that's the whole intent of the law that was passed in 2009 called the SSRO and the SSRD, the State System uh, Reform Office and the State System uh, uh, Reform District. And the law provides that uh, the Department of Education identifies the 5% of non-performing or low-performing schools and they go into this district. After their reform, they would go back to their public school districts. And that's exactly what we have recommended, that the EAA become part of the law. There is a law that's currently structured that will allow us to reform and restructure 
uh, a school district like the EAA. So you say eventually they should they should return, and when you're talking about control of the school board, you say eventually DPS should go back to um, an elected school board. So people at home or parents might say, okay, well, what kind of timeline are, are you looking at when you say eventually? What kind of, uh, what kind of time do we see? I, I don't have a timeline for you because a lot of this depends upon the acceptance of the governor and then obviously changing law at the legislature level to be able to implement these recommendations. These recommendations cannot be implemented unilaterally. We're going to have to change the way Michiganders see public education. All right, go ahead. Uh, I covered DPS 20 years ago uh, for the free press and saw lots of different ideas and plans, lots of different reform uh, agendas rolled out and they all were very well intentioned, a lot of them were very well thought out and they all failed. Um, tell me why this is different than any of those and why you think it might have a better chance of success. Well, I, I believe that, number one, we're at a tipping point. Uh, many, many forces have come together. Uh, the legacy cost, the depopulation of the city of Detroit, Detroit's bankruptcy. Uh, I believe that uh, the citizens and this coalition, the legislature and the governor have this unique opportunity to make a significant change and a significant difference. Uh, other than that, uh, it's going to just take a lot of hard work, a lot of debate, and for us to settle on what's right for our state. And uh, we're, at a, we're, at a, we're at this crossroads because Michigan has continued to sink over the last 10, 15 years in terms of its academic achievement. What's interesting is, is that I believe it's 15 years ago, Michigan was tied with Massachusetts as the 23rd best state for public education. Since that period of time, Michigan has slipped from uh, 23rd to something in the 40s. I, I don't recall if it was 45th or 48th. And Massachusetts has gone to number one. We need to take a look at these states that have achieved such tremendous success and emulate them and copy many of the things that they've done. It's worked. We need to bring it to Michigan and make it work here. And that's more of a statewide issue. I mean, what you're talking about there, that's not just about Detroit. Some of the things that you guys are seeing in, in DPS and in the charter schools here are common, you know, in Ishpeming or in Manistee. That's true, absolutely. Uh, what's interesting is, is that last year out of the 500 and some school districts in the state, all but one lost student population. So much of this is also caused by the depopulation. This is where the budget problem, the substantial portion of the budget problem is coming from. You just can't catch up fast enough in terms of reducing your fixed cost to keep pace with a vast number of students that are leaving. Now John, you, you all recommended that this commission uh, that I assume will serve until the school board takes over. I don't know what role it would have afterwards, but that the commission members will be all appointed by the mayor. Doesn't that inject a, the, the potential for politics into this, into this process? Uh, we don't believe so, and uh, I don't want you to confuse the Detroit Public School Board with the Detroit uh, Education mm -hmm. Commission. They're completely separate. We need some authority that oversees education across the whole city if nothing more than to the opening, closing, and the positioning of schools and to making sure there are standards that we can measure low-performing schools by and have common agreement as to when we close them, whether they be DPS schools, charter schools, EAA schools, or any other kind of schools. So the Detroit Election Commission is not intended to replace the DPS. But you've, you've structured it so that the mayor would point all the, the members. Would it, would, was there any discussion that, um, of having the governor appoint a few, someone else, so that you get a, little, a, a more diverse voice there? We preferred to allow the governor and the mayor to debate that issue themselves. All right, so let's talk about the governor. You've obviously, the coalition is going to hand him and his people this report. What are you hearing so far? He said in public, well, I'm going to take a look and thank them very much for their work. But what do you think the possibility of him implementing the majority of your recommendations really is? They're sound recommendations, and uh, I fully expect myself that the government's going to take a good look at them, and he's going to implement many of them. I mean, he knows he has a problem with the EAA today, and uh, we've given him a very good solution. Fund the law the way it was intended, and put the EAA schools into the state uh, reform district. Uh, that's a great solution for him. He's, uh, the, he's taken that and put it into the Department of Management and Budget. He'll still be able to control it and just follow the law. The, the law is very 
prescriptive in what to do. Uh, some of these other things might be a little bit more difficult, um, especially the debt. I'm sure the legislature is going to have a lot to say about that. But at the end of the day, what's really happening here is in concerning the debt and also the pension payments. Uh, we are paying for yesterday's sins with tomorrow's children. And it's just unacceptable to the coalition and it's personally unacceptable to me. I think it borders on being immoral. As we wrap up here, John, what has the reaction been of parents in the Detroit schools to this report? I, I don't know. I have not come in contact uh, with parents since this has been uh, released. I can tell you this, that I spent significant amount of time traveling to schools with parents and sort of trying to understand uh, the, uh, uh, the condition of the system and how they felt about it. And all I can say is, is that they were very, very encouraging for us to go as far and as deep as we possibly can in our recommendation. There is a great frustration in the city of Detroit. The vast majority of parents that I've come in contact with understand the need for education, understand the need for skills going forward, and they want their children to have a better life than them. And we all know it starts with education. John Ricolta, thanks so much for joining us. And we will be watching now in the next couple of months to see where this goes. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. As we mentioned, the sweeping changes recommended in the coalition's report could have a major impact on education in Michigan. In fact, the report is titled The Road to Excellence for Troubled Michigan Schools Begins in Detroit. All right, so obviously, guys, this is a, this is a statewide issue in terms of uh, education, and John touched on that a little bit. Nolan, I'm going to start with you and mm -hmm. say, were there any surprises for you coming out of this report or, or disappointments for you? Well, I mean, I think it's... My disappointment is that it's too heavily weighted to saving the Detroit public schools, and I think that's a lost cause. I think we've been trying to save these schools for 20 years or more. The state has done all sorts of different plans and, and all sorts of different things to save these schools. I don't think as an institution uh, the, the resources are there to save them. I would have preferred a more radical approach, a more innovative sweeping approach, perhaps a New Orleans model to charter all schools. I think this, the potential here for politics to, to really get in the way of true school choice in Detroit is enormous now if this plan were to be adopted. I think there are some things in there, the, the transportation piece particularly is essential and I think if they could, if they could do that it would actually um, allow kids to get to, to better schools or more kids to get to better schools. But on the whole, I wouldn't expect um, the bulk of this plan to end up in the governor's, in the governor's strategy. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's a, it's a decent plan. I mean, I, I disagree with Nolan about the, the public schools and the charter schools. Mm -hmm. We have 56,000 kids exercising choice today, and for the most part, they aren't getting a better education. I mean, choice has That's failed true. us. Choice has failed us spectacularly in Detroit, uh, and it was promised that not only would we get better schools out of the charter schools, better education for kids out of charter schools, but that it was going to improve the Detroit public schools. So we can't now say that the solution to improving public education has now killed it and then go with the solution that hasn't, hasn't produced better results and for it, us. And, you know, you keep repeating that, Steve, it's just not too. Stanford University out with a report on Detroit charter schools, kids in Slightly Detroit charter better. schools gaining three months progress every year compared to their counterparts in the, in the Detroit public schools. That is a lot more progress. It's not a lot more. Um, most schools are, are performing better in math and reading. Most kids Slightly in charters better. are. 35 and 40 percent better, Steve. All right, that's so a Stanford report. Those aren't marginal. A Stanford report is full of a lot of really problematic analyses too, and and other reports have shown that the the progress is just not that different, on average. Graduation rates higher, and the thing that John Ricolta mentioned, I think, is the is the key that often gets overlooked here when you talk about performance of these schools. The woman he described picked that school, had nothing to do with academics. She wanted her kids in a safe, nurturing environment and a that place is, where she felt welcome. That is the major okay. difference. That All right. is a critical difference. And, th and that is good, but I want to take it a bit beyond the, the public versus charter debate here mm -hmm. and take a look at is there an appetite in the legislature right now to take on, to assume some of Detroit Public Schools' debt because that is a large piece of this plan and the debt that the school system has right now is one of the, of the massive well, um, problems. Well, there are two reasons that the state has no choice but to take this debt. One is they ran it up. Uh, they, were, they were in charge of the schools while most of this debt was incurred. 
that's a basic rule of governance. You break it, you bought it. Uh, they, they can't push that on anybody else. The second reason is that the state is the guarantor of, of all that debt anyway. And so e even if you left it in, in DPS hands and they defaulted, the state would pay it uh, right. in the end anyway. And it would be more expensive to pay it that way than it would to figure out a way to finance that right now. Yeah, this, this debt belongs to the state. I mean, contractually, it, involved, it belongs to the state, and the legislature can huff and puff, but, I mean, they back the bond debt, and they encourage the, the bond sales. So. All right, so I think it's going to be interesting to see now how this coalition report fits into what the governor has been thinking about, what Paul Pastrick has been thinking about and working with the governor. Um, what are you hearing, Nolan? I think they'll, there's elements of this plan that will go in maybe as much as half of the plan. I'm not sure the governance models will be adopted. Uh, the governor sees a, at, from what we're hearing, the governor sees more of a portfolio o, o approach rather than the traditional DPS approach. So I think it'll be interesting to see which pieces of this he picks. All right, now to a quick look at other stories making news this week. The Detroit City Council and City Clerk, well, they're getting a pay raise, and the controversy grows in response to Indiana's new Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Could Michigan be next? All right, so let's start um, first and really quickly mention Detroit City Council will finally get a little bit of a pay raise. Bump. Stephen? Uh, they're underpaid, and there's no question about that. It, it, it's not a, it's not uh, the kind of job or salary structure that would attract the, the kind of talent that you want and need uh, to govern the city better. The, the problem is that, that this is just not being put in any context. I mean, if, if city council is underpaid, think about how many other people. I mean, everybody who works for everybody. city government has taken huge uh, cuts and given up lots of things over the last five or ten years. Uh, I'm not sure I would have put council at the front of the line to get those things back. I mean, I think I would have looked at bus drivers or uh, garbage workers or people making clerical workers making very little money and now not, not being able to count on the kind of pensions that they had uh, before. Those are the people who are really hurting cops, uh, firefighters, uh, not necessarily city council people who are underpaid, but but uh, are in a whole different class of earnings. Was this a good move, Nolan? No, it looks like politicians taking care of themselves first. The city just got out of bankruptcy. Brenda Jones asked for this raise the very same week that the pensioners took their first cut in their monthly benefit checks. The optics are horrible, but the rationale is terrible, too. I mean, let's see how they perform. They just got control of the city back. I disagree with the talent attraction. They had 135 people apply for that one opening. The salary wasn't a deterrent um, in terms of interest in the job. Well, and maybe in terms of quality, though. Well, there's a, a pay is not going to guarantee quality as long as it's a, um, you know, a, a process where people have to be elected. I mean, that's no guarantee of quality. All right. Now, I hate to do this with just about three minutes left, but um, I, I don't think you can go through the week without seeing what the news coming out of Indiana and talking about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and what could possibly be happening here in Michigan, Stephen. What's, uh, what's percolating in the legislature in, in Lansing that could put us on the same path? And has Michigan learned anything from watching what's happened in Indiana Well, this they week? should be watching pretty closely. I mean, it's not just uh, uh, leftist uh, uh, gay rights advocates, for instance, who are against this. You have the business community that's come out very strongly against it. You have uh, uh, major sports organizations. This is bad for business because it is discrimination. It is trying to sow discrimination into the law ahead of uh, of constitutional rulings, they think are coming out of the out of the high court uh, this spring that that will that will prevent it. The practical effect of these will probably be almost nothing uh, in the long run. I expect that it will not be legal to even to even try to do this very soon. But it's but it's a, a, a black mark for for Indiana that they that they've done this, uh, and Michigan should not follow suit. Michigan had a law um, last year that was more like the federal law and the law in 20 other states. Indiana's law is much more aggressive, um, applies to corporations, applies to personal transactions. Michigan's didn't. Um, but it was also paired with an expansion of the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act to cover um, gays and lesbians and should have been passed, and they should have been tie barred and passed in tandem. Um, you had a, another political squabble. Uh, in, in the legislature, Democrats uh, killed the, the, the proposal because it didn't include transgenders in specific language. And, you know, now here we sit a long way from uh, getting either one passed. So do you think what's happening in Indiana is going to make lawmakers here pause? 
I don't think it'll make the lawmakers pause. It may make the gov it may influence what the governor does. All right. Well, we shall see what happens. Thanks, guys. As usual, it's always good to see you. And that is going to do it for my week. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to continue our conversation online right after the show. So go to myweek.org for an extra segment that you won't see on TV. We're also on Facebook and we are on Twitter during the week. So make sure you connect with us there. We're all very social people. I'm Christy McDonald. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, we will see you next week. Take care. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.